Ah, here we go. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Morning, morning. How are we all? Oh, not too bad. Not too bad. <laughs> Can't get to Australia. <laughs> no, Australia's definitely off at the moment. Uh, yes. Okay, we're just wait, waiting for a few more people to join us and then we'll get going. Okay. I'm just getting Yetta up on hers. Right. Actually, I think pretty much everybody's here already. You're all very prompt, very impressed. Excellent. That's what we want to see. Okay. <laughs> okay, so good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Um, hopefully this is a nice time for a, a sit down with a coffee and uh, think about some lovely travel destinations. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Carolyn, Director of See the World. Um, also on the call today is Zoe um, Barnes, who if you've got multiple people on your screen, she's wearing a very nice green top. Um, she's from our Bath office and she'll be um, throughout the call and we'll be around at the end if there's any questions relating to see the world. Um, looking after you today is the lovely David and Sunita from Travel the Unknown and hopefully they're going to inspire you with um, what is a fascinating, absolutely fascinating route and destination and something that I think we're all I know there's a lot of us in the office that would very much like to do it. Um, so it's something that will hopefully inspire for future travels. So um, David and Sunita will look after you and also any little, little bits of housekeeping regarding the Zoom call. Um, so hope you enjoy it. Thank you for joining us and uh, hopefully we'll get you all traveling somewhere nice soon. Enjoy. Over to you, David. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Good. Okay. Um, if, if you don't mind, if everyone, if you haven't already, and I think most of you already have, if you can just turn off your, your microphones and your cameras, just so uh, we can hopefully keep the experience as smooth as we can for everybody else. Um, just generally the quality is a little bit better if we do that. Um, so yeah, so basically, I, obviously, we, I've got a, a mammoth task to take you through the whole Silk Road in um, half an hour or so so it's going to necessarily be a bit of a whirlwind tour and um, there's a lot of pictures in there some of them i'm going to just skip over pretty quickly um, but hopefully it'll give you a little bit of a flavor of what the silk road has to offer um, one of the things that always strikes me when i come back to do one of these presentations is that um I, I usually start by taking one of the previous presentations and sometimes we have different people present different parts who are maybe a little bit more specialist um, and I always find that when I got, get to the part that somebody else has presented, I'm presented with their pictures and suddenly I'm stuck because their, their pictures tell their story and actually I can't tell their story. And I think that's what really makes this quite an interesting experience is that everybody has their own experience. Everybody has their own story to tell. And, you know, when you go travel this part of the world, you will have your own stories. Of course, you'll see these iconic sites. I mean, there are lots of them. They're incredible. But it's usually those little stories, those little personal interactions that really bring the experience alive and bring these parts of the world to life. So, OK, so I'm going to just jump straight in and this is a little bit about Travel the Unknown. So we do small group tours, now down to eight because of coronavirus. There have been 12 previously. Um, we do tailor-made as well as private tours. So there's a lot of uh, group departures going out. Um, we have an intimate personal knowledge of all of our destinations. Um, we work with the best local partners and the, the most passionate and knowledgeable guides. You know, obviously we'd spend time in these destinations getting to know them to make sure that we're able to ensure all of these things. Um, we're recommended by the major guidebooks, um, Lonely Planet, Rough Guide, Brat, etc. Um, and we're, we're fully financially protected and at all bonded. Um, we also won the, the British Travel Awards uh, over the last couple of years. Um, okay, so what is the Silk Road? So again, I'm not sure how well you're gonna be able to see this map, depending on what sort of device you're looking at it, but there's a lot in there. But just to give you a very quick summary, um, basically the, the sort of the colored routes are a few of our tours. Um, so the red one is obviously is the Silk Road through China, then the blue one is the Silk Road through the Stan, Silk Road through Iran is green, and then Silk Road through Turkey. These are just a selection. We actually have a lot more tours, but these are the ones that run sort of back to back. 
the gray banded areas that you see, so there's one along the sort of top and one a little lower, are the sort of historic Silk Road routes. Um, and I guess the point is that there isn't one route here. These are bands quite precisely because there, there were many different routes and it changed over time. It changed in, in short term and it changed in the long term. You know, it may be that there was a flood up ahead and so you had to take a different route. And of course, over, t over longer time frames, different routes would open up. You know, there may be, have been political problems. There may have been, um, you know, there may, they had their coronaviruses of their day as well, of course, back in the ancient times for, for the Silk Road and, you know, routes would have had to be be um, adjusted according to that. Um, so okay, so what was the Silk Road and what is the Silk Road? Um, so the Silk Road was a trade route that was developed in the second century, starting in Xi'an in China, which is where silk was first produced. Um, obviously it was the first connection between East and West, so there's a lot of historical connections, a lot of things that happened for the first time when these cultures met for, um, you know, and, and had these interactions. There's a lot of interesting uh, stories that go along with that. As I said, there were many paths, not just one, both by land and by sea. And um, the main things that, well, some of the main things that went from east to west along this route, as it was primarily a trade route, were silk, paper, gunpowder, spices, Buddhism, and a little more sinisterly, the, the plague. Um, and then from west to east, you had wool, goods, sorry, gold, uh, silver, and Christianity. And Islam, I guess, technically went in, in both directions, really, along the Silk Road. Um, but, you know, this is the point. It wasn't just a trading route. One, as, long, as soon as people started to travel these routes, then obviously ideas and ideologies and diseases and everything, you know, it, it was really the beginning of, of globalization. And um, within China, then the Silk uh, the Silk Road caused the the Great Wall of China to be something that was needed. You know, you had this lucrative trade route that suddenly needed protections from the the Mongol hordes and and other outsiders. And um, the route then largely collapsed in the 18th century. Um, though in more recent years, and um, I guess over the last sort of 30 or 40 years, it, it, there has been a, a a move to revive it both as a trade route and um, but also for for tourism so why would you travel along the silk road um so first thing is huge diversity and um, people language religion culture food and um, the history so again there's an incredible and very interesting history through a lot of these regions, but also the history of these cultural inter interchanges that happened um, throughout the, the Silk Road all along the way and these meetings of East and West, but all sorts of little smaller versions of that too. And um, there's a real sense of the journey. So it's, it's a long route that it covers a lot and you really get the sense of the changes along the way in the landscapes and, and all of the things I mentioned above. Um, many of the regions are still largely untouched by, by mass tourism, um, so you get a very different kind of experience than you do in, in many other places. And you can see quite random things like this. So this is one of my pictures from, from Kashgar in China, um, just as you do, selling something so that's slightly unusual that maybe you don't see everywhere else. Okay, so um, I'm just going to do a quick time check. Okay, so I've got just over 20 minutes to take you along the Silk Road. So this is the Chinese leg. So the, the Silk Road within China or within China's borders today is, is very long. And um, China's a, a vast country. And if you look at this on the, the whole map, actually you'll see that a big chunk of the Silk Road was within China's borders or within China's borders today. Um, so obviously Xi'an we discussed already. So I'm gonna just flick through some of these pictures and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly but obviously the terracotta warriors were the, is the most famous site in, in Xi'an um, Xi'an itself was the, the home for 13 of the dynasties this was the ancient capital um, and obviously you can see that the, these beautiful terracotta soldiers all, all individual all modeled on, on real soldiers um, with, within that as well, before you've even left Xi'an, you get a sense of some of the things that have happened um, because of the Silk Road. And this is the, the Muslim quarter. 
and this is the, the night market, this is the food market, this is where all the locals go to get their food, but it's a big Muslim area, you have a, a grand mosque there as well. Um, so you're already starting to see the influences of things that have come into China from um, outside. Okay, so this is more of the night market. Okay, and this is one of the next sites that you'll see along the way. This is the this is the Labrang Monastery. So this is a Tibetan monastery. Again, another import from the Silk Road. And um, it's a beautiful monastery, very fast. Obviously, it's Tibetan Buddhism. And you have three kilometers of these prayer wheels all along the way. And this is just one of the, the buildings within it. Beautiful area as well, very mountainous. Okay, and now we get on to Xiaguan. This is the, the end of the, the Great Wall. Um, and actually, this is quite a far away inside of China today. Um, but obviously, at the time in the Imperial China, the Ming Dynasty, etc., this would have been the end of the Great Wall, the end of China, effectively. Um, and this was where you, you would find the Conciliation Gate. Um, and the conciliation gate was basically if you fell afoul of the authorities, if you committed a crime that they considered worthy of expulsion, this is where you would be kicked out. And basically everything beyond that was considered pure barbarism by the Chinese and you were left to your own devices, everyone. If you were cast out through the gate of conciliation, it was considered that was pretty much the end of you. Um, so today there's a lot more within China's border beyond that, which Effectively, from this point, you really start to see that, okay, well, though China is a much bigger country today than it would have been, actually, you're already now starting to see changes in the landscape, in the people, in the culture, in the religion, in the food. Everything basically starts to really change. You've had the sort of the, the Han Chinese as a vast majority up until this point, and now you're starting to see, at, at the very least, a mix and the further um, to the to the west that you go, the more you're starting to see the sort of Central Asian influences. Um, so here we have Don Huang, which is a UNESCO heritage site. You have these um, beautiful caves. You're into the, the first of the kind of great deserts. Um, so this is right on the edge of the, the, both the Gobi and the Taklamakan Desert, so two, two great deserts. Um, again, this is where the sort of the great game, which is sort of the precursors to the, the Cold War, um, was played out all from this area sort of all the way through Central Asia and, and this was effectively you know where Russia and Britain were vying for influence um, Britain trying to defend its you know its crown jewel colony of India the Russians trying to maneuver to, to capture more territory um, possibly with an eye to taking India at some point or possibly that was a little bit of a and, you know, um, the, the British um, at, at the time worrying about things that weren't really happening, but um, I guess we'll never fully know that. Um, so again, this is this is in the same area. So this is Turpan, which is a, um, an area, it's the driest part of China. It gets very hot um, it's very famous for its grapes. It has a huge variety of grapes and already you start to see you now the faces, the, the, the sort of instrument that this man is playing is not typically Chinese, the hat, um, and he's, he's a Muslim as well. So you're really starting to see actually sort of everything that you sort of took to be China is now starting to change and we're still quite far within China's borders. Um, so from, from Turpan we're, we're moving through, um, and this is actually I think on the uh, outskirts of Dunhuang, um, this is in Turpan, this is the Flaming Mountain. You can see it's very arid terrain and very beautiful. They have a lot of um, water systems. The Kare system, it's similar to the, the Kanat system in Iran. And again, this is a UNESCO heritage site that, you know, it shows the sort of the water technology that's transferred along. So this knowledge would have been come from Iran first to this area. And again, that would have come not obviously before the Silk Road, it would have, this knowledge would have passed along with those traders and um, nomads that would have, would have come along the Silk Road. And so again, here we're into Kashgar and you can see these beautiful minarets. Um, Kashgar is a fantastic city, very interesting. And um, you've got some beautiful mosques. This is one of the Sufi mosques. Um, and the, this is the, the sort of the star of the show of Kashgar is their Sunday livestock market. Um, if you like taking photographs, this is somewhere you can stay all day. I mean, 
all the, more or less all of the photographs in this uh, presentation are my own photos. So I'm, I, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm telling my story, but uh, this was somewhere I could have happily stayed the whole day. It was a fascinating place. There's sort of fantastic photos anywhere you look. Um, and it's just, it, it has real, real character. It's something that you kind of think, well, you know, it's not something you'll see kind of in, everywhere in the world. Um, and it's very real as well. I mean, obviously there are, there are some tourists there as well on the Sunday markets, but not as many as you might expect. Okay, so the next leg of the tour brings us into Central Asia. So as you can see, Kashgar was where we ended on the right of your screen, and now we come in through, so I'm gonna talk us quickly through Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan. So as I said, it's gonna be a whirlwind tour. Um, so here we're into Kyrgyzstan, and this is Tashrabat. So this is just over the border from China. And this is one of the remote caravanserais. So again, caravanserais were the places where the traders would have stayed. They were typically uh, lodges where you could get everything. You get your food, you get your bedding for the night, you can get your, you know, what you need for your, your animals. Um, and this is, these would be, would be the places where, you know, information was exchanged, where people met, where, you know, ideas, business plans were hatched, um, you know, probably political intrigues would have happened and um, you know these were the these were the places where these kind of things would have happened um, and this one in in Tashrabat it's possibly some people believe it was in the story in church so this was a branch of Christianity that made it all the way out to China um, and yeah I mean there's a lot of uh, question marks about how much of it is you know how far they went how, how in depth it became but it was definitely something that that was in this area whether this was one or not i don't know and um, so again in, in kyrgyzstan you've got a lot of high mountains so there's mountains of over eight thousand meters and um, the scenery pretty much anywhere you are in, in uh, kyrgyzstan you're going to see sea mountains um, and obviously where you have mountains in this part of the world you have yaks um, so this is the traditional Kyrgyz dress. This is a lady who I just met and she was, she, as soon as she saw me, she decided she wanted to go and show me her, her traditional dress. So she ran inside and, and put on her traditional dress to show me and um, very, very warm, very friendly people. Um, this is Isikul Lake. So this is a massive lake in, in uh, Kyrgyzstan. Um, again, I traveled in the spring, so you see the beautiful flowers um, in the springtime, but it's, it's, it's a massive lake and you have these huge snow-capped mountains that go run all along the north coast of the lake. Um, and it's a beautiful drive all around the, the lake. You get to see a huge range of different things. This is one of the sites on the south where you can meet the, the eagle trainers. Um, and they spend, they spend 40 years sometimes with the eagles and um, they develop this very close bond it's very very interesting thing to see um, these are just a, some of the the local women selling things in the market and um, this is i think this was called the the valley of the flowers um, spectacular place very tranquil and um, beautiful lake beautiful river running just to the front um, this is further now towards the capital. This is Burana. Um, this was once the, the, the capital of the Islamic world and um, largely been forgotten today. Um, and these are actually, these predate Islam and these are, um, they were called bulbuls. And if you look closely, you can see he's got a, um, a cup in one hand and a knife in the other. Um, and I guess the, the idea behind this was the cup was, you know, I will welcome you and you're my guest. Um, but you know, make sure you behave properly. <laughs> um, uh, the, 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 the sign for um, what might happen was, was not very subtle. Um, okay, so now we're into Uzbekistan. Um, I guess for a lot of people, when they think about the Silk Road, Uzbekistan is where they're really thinking about a lot of the TV programs that you'll see this is where they're going to spend a lot of time. So this is, you know, with Iran, I would say Iran and Uzbekistan are where you'll see the most incredible Islamic art um, anywhere in the world. Um, this is Samarkand. Um, this is Registan Square. This is one of the most photographed uh, spots. It, beautiful mosques and, and palaces all around. Inside the buildings as well are equally spectacular. And uh, this is the roof and inside one of the, the buildings there. And this is from, um, this is the Bibi Kana Mosque. And so this was built by Tamerlane. So Tamerlane, uh, as we would know him, or Timur, um, he basically built Samarkand. And 
spent many, many years building it. So he, he destroyed large parts of the world and he laid waste to most of the places he visited. Um, but Samarkand was what he built to make up, I suppose, for, for the destruction he caused in a lot of other places. But it, it's a truly spectacular. And the Bibi Canal Mosque is the one that he built for his wife at the time. Um, this is another beautiful, but yeah, absolutely stunning. I mean, really, the, there's so much there, it's almost overwhelming. Um, this is one, this is Shai Zinda. Um, this is a, a, a mausoleum uh, where all of his female relatives were buried. Um, absolutely spectacular. This is one that sees fewer visitors, and actually, for me, this was the most spectacular of them all. Um, here you see some, some ladies in this sort of traditional Uzbek dress. Um, here we're into Bukhara. Bukhara is a, what, there's three sort of main Silk Road cities that are quite famous in Uzbekistan. So Samarkand is the first, Bukhara is the second, Kiva is the third. Um, so this is the, the Samani Mosque. So this is a 10th century mosque. Absolutely stunning. So this is sort of before you get the sort of blue tiled effect. So this is a little older, um, but it's absolutely stunning. I mean, it just the, the building is really beautiful. You get inside, you can look at it from so many different angles and, you know, without any color, they were able to produce these marvelous uh, buildings. Um, and then we come on to Kiva. Um, Kiva basically is the sort of the last of the classic cities um, in Uzbekistan. Um, and it has a, it's a smaller city and it has two walls. The, inside the inner wall, everything inside the inner wall is UNESCO heritage. Um, you have these absolutely incredible uh, minarets. Um, we have some, some people selling bread. This is the, this is the inner wall. Um, so inside the outer wall, you have some, some normal people living. Inside the inner wall, you can stay in there, but it's just absolutely spectacular. Spectacular, you see some, some of the kids playing just against some of the buildings in there. And they have all these old doors on all the buildings. I mean, I took probably 100 photos at least of different doors. Um, so, so old, so beautiful, all completely different and handmade. Um, this is one of the, the famous minarets. Um, it's called the short minaret. I mean, it's 36 meters high or something, but it was, it was planned to be 72. Um, the, the son took on the project when the father died, but decided not to. Um, not to continue building because he was afraid then it would take his name rather than his father's. Um, unfortunately for him, it, it became known as the Short Minaret, so it took neither of their names in the end. Again, here's some more of the doors. Um, again, you see some of the beautiful Islamic art. And of course, silk. So again, in the, the eastern part of uh, Uzbekistan, you can, see, you can go see silk. You can see this is the, the silk worm and the, the, the silk pod that they make all of this from. Um, and you can see the, the weavers creating different crafts from, from the silk. And just a reminder, I suppose, that you can also pack light. So this was one of the cars that drove up into Kiva while I was there. I thought, wow, that's quite, quite impressive. Um, and don't forget to bring your phone so you can stay in touch with people at home. <laughs> All right, just a couple of silly pictures there. Um, okay, so this is now we're into Turkmenistan. Uh, Turkmenistan is sometimes known as the, the North Korea light. Um, it has had quite a, a strong dictator sit over the country for some years and has had, had some crazy rules about what you can and can't do. So um, you, at one point you were not allowed to play against the law to play music in your car um, and there's still plenty of silly rules that are banned but this is one of the sites in the north this is Kunya or Genj um, beautiful site and um, some some spectacular this is one of the minarets I mean mind-bogglingly uh, high and, and and beautiful and a little uh, unsteady as well. Um, but this is where Tamerlane got his inspiration, in fact. So this is one of the sites that he didn't destroy, one of the very few places that he, he was so impressed by that he let it stay standing. Um, and he actually got his uh, architects to come and study this place before they came back to build the, the splendors of uh, Samarkand today. Um, so you can see it's obviously, it's a, it's a it's a more primitive um, design, but it's, it's really beautiful as well. Um, and <clears throat> this is the desert, this is the Karakum Desert, so it's very, um, it's, it's very arid, but it's very beautiful as well. 
um, and you can go and stay there. There's a very unusual site. So you can see if you look on the right hand side of the picture, you'll see some people standing there. But this is what's known as the gates of hell. This is Darvaza gas crater. Um, <clears throat> and basically the story is that the the Russians discovered some gas in this area. They weren't interested in gas, they were interested in oil. So they decided, okay, well, let's just burn off the gas and see what, see what we find, see if we can get some oil underneath. And so they, they tossed a match down um, and that was about 60 years ago and it's still burning. Um, it's an amazing, amazing thing to see. You know, um, obviously it's best seen at night. Um, it is out in the middle of nowhere and there's no accommodation. So if you do want to see it, there's two options. One, you go, you, you camp there for the night in the sand or you go and you drive. You kind of have to see it at night to get its full glory. Um, but then you can drive back over a very bumpy road and get back to the capital Ashgabat by about 2 a.m. That's me at the, the gates of hell. And this is another one of the archaeological sites, Nisha. Um, and these are just some local girls. So there's a lot of traditional dress still worn in, in Turkmenistan. And this is just a random bus stop, people waiting for the bus. Um, lots of very strange architecture in Ashgabat. This is the, the Palace of Happiness. And um, basically there was an ancient city there that was destroyed in an earthquake was rebuilt in the 70s in a very sort of Soviet style. That city has been almost completely replaced. Um, Turkmenistan has a lot of oil money and it had a dictator with a, a fetish for building. So they've built this big marble, lots of gold, lots of marble, lots of big statues. Um, this is the, the Palace of Happiness where you go to, to register your wedding or your divorce. Uh, obviously both very joyous occasions. Um, and this is the, the first leader, Turkmen Bashi, as he called himself, or the father of the Turkmen. Um, he wasn't the most modest of, of men, um, but lots of, lots of interesting um, quirky stories. Um, so they, they, the, they currently still have a ministry of the horse, uh, a ministry of carpets uh, as part of the government, um, and they also have a, a, a national bedtime in effect. Um, so they kind of have a nationwide curfew, which is always in effect. Um, one of the weird things that happened to me when I was there, when I was driving back from Darvaza, we came into the, we came into Ashgabat and my driver started looking around for a car wash before we arrived to, to Ashgabat, the capital. And he couldn't find a car wash. There wasn't one where he expected to find one. So he drove to another village and I was starting to get a little bit impatient because I didn't have a huge amount of time. And, you know, I thought, well, you know, can he not wash his car a little bit later? So anyway, next thing he jumps out of the car and starts washing the car. So I, it later transpired that he actually had to have a clean car to be allowed into Ashgabat. Um, there was no way he was getting in. So yeah, slightly strange place. Um, so I'm not going to talk about uh, Kazakhstan, but this is just one of our more recently launched tours. This is a rocket launch tour. So you can actually go to Baikonur Cosmodrome, um, which is where basically all of the Russian rockets, the Soviet rockets, I guess, at the time, and a lot of the Russian rockets today are, are launched from. And you can actually go and, you know, it, there's a lot to see at the Cosmodrome anyway. The, you know, there's a, a huge amount of history of space travel. You can visit the... You can but get very up close and personal with the the rockets in a way that you won't in let's say um cape <coughs> excuse me cape canaveral um but you can also go for specific um dates and actually see a rocket launch i think which is something really incredible and um, that one i've not done and um, i'm not going to go through jordan because i'm running out of time here i'm just going to skim you through some pictures very quickly so you get a little bit of a sense of it This is, uh, so this is Wali Rum Desert. Um, we had, uh, this is Dana National Park. And um, these are the mosaics of Madaba. These are the Crusader castles. Uh, this is obviously the Dead Sea. And I'm very, 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 very briefly going to talk about Turkey because again, with time is running a little bit short. But if you're interested in history, ancient history, Turkey is the place. Um, obviously, Istanbul. Uh, Constantinople, as it was known, um, is an amazing city. Cappadocia is one of the, the main sort of cultural highlights, both from a historical perspective, but also these incredible landscapes and natural formations. 
Western Turkey, you have a lot of incredible Roman sites. I mean, Roman sites that are unmatched anywhere else in the world, I would say. And this is Ephesus. Um, but there, these are vast sites. I mean, this is the, one of the most famous buildings there, but actually the site is huge and there are many other buildings that are just as beautiful. But if you want variety in your history and you want sites that are genuinely really old, Eastern Turkey cannot be matched. Um, so this is one of the mosaics in Gaziantep. This is the Gypsy Girl mosaic. Uh, this is Akdamer Church on uh, it's on an island basically in the middle of Lake Van, which itself is a spectacular lake, and you have 360 degrees of snow-capped mountains. And this is a, this is a place called Halfeti, and this is, is a, basically is a flooded village with the minaret coming out of the water, um, can only be reached by boat these days. And this is the Ishak Pasha Palace, so this was kind of the pinnacle of Ottoman architecture, and this is right over on the, the border with here. Um, with Armenia, and you can see, um, losing my uh, Mount Ararat in the in the background, and um, this is some of the the carving detail. I mean, it's really spectacular building, and this is Mount Nemrod, where you have these huge head statues on a hill that overlooks the Tigris and the Euphrates, and this is another one of the statues, and um, this is. Um, this is basically a place where you have all these holy trout. It's a city called Urfa. Um, and again, this is a very holy city for many people, but it goes, there's the birthplace of Abraham is here. And there's a huge variety of sites. And I'll finish with Gobekli Tepe, um, which if you haven't heard of it, is probably, in my opinion, um, the most important archaeological site in the world. Um, it's not as famous as some others yet, but it's gradually getting more and more famous. Um, it's the oldest place of worship in the world. It's so old, uh, it's about 12,000 years old, um, you know, roughly twice, the, twice as old as Stonehenge, much more advanced technologically, and <clears throat> it's older. It was built by nomads as well, so it sort of turns on, on its head the idea that religion was discovered um, as a way to sort of keep people um, in bigger communities once agriculture had allowed us to be able to do that. Um, it's, a, it's a huge site, only a small part of it's been excavated and it's quite fascinating to see. Um, so very briefly, I'm not going to talk you through all of these, but you can see we have a lot of different tours that we do um, throughout the Silk Road. Um, there are the ones that I showed on the, on the map. There's some places that I didn't even discuss in this presentation because obviously we've got a, a limited time, but we do obviously Iran, we do the Caucasus, um, Lebanon, obviously it's very sad what's happened there just now. Um, we do hope that it'll, it'll get back on its feet before too long, but um, Oman, again, that would have been somewhere that was on, along the sea route. Um, and of course we do private tours, tailor-made tours as well. Um, we can customize any of these. So that's it really. Um, so does anybody have any questions or anything that they would like to ask? Um, I'm gonna see, you can either, well, I guess if you want to come back on, you can turn your mics on or. Anyone have any questions? If you prefer, you can, you can post one through in the, in the channel. Um, yeah, I've got one quick question. Um, yes. Obviously, the whole thing is is, is photography oriented. It, it, there's so many beautiful things to be photographed. Do, what are there any levels of? Are there any restrictions on photography inside the mosques and the other uh, important buildings? Uh, obviously, the outside is free free game. But what about inside these places? No, generally, I mean, there's nowhere, nowhere I can think of that has, <coughs> has any restrictions in terms of photography inside the mosques. Um, Iran has a, a small number of mosques where you're, you know, as a, as a foreigner that you're not allowed into, or as a, a man, you might not be allowed into a couple of them, but they're really very limited. Um, and I can only think of one particular place, but in, in terms of the places that we discussed on this, not, not, no, no such restrictions. I mean, obviously the usual sort of military installations, big transport hubs, airports, train stations, those kind of things are often quite sensitive. Um, and 
taking pictures of people is something that um, you need to be careful of in certain places. A lot of places that are very happy for you to do it, and, but you should always just check in advance. But no, in terms of the, 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 the kind of buildings that I was showing them, nothing, nothing there that you, you couldn't photo photograph. Um, hello, I'd like to ask a question. Yes, hi, who am um, I speaking to? Uh, I'm Joanna Galpin, living in Bristol. Um, yeah. Do you have anything possibly going this this autumn? I mean, under that when when present um, uh, I, I, if present I, rules would allow, is there anything that you would have planned? I think. I mean, if I'm being realistic, if you know, it's we haven't ruled it out. I think it's unlikely. Um, okay. You know, for this for this region, I think most likely. 2021 is what we're looking at um, um, and what is the very best time of year to um, um to it's, go again it's a broad area so i can't give you a, a single answer to that but roughly speaking, it would be the asian area i'd be interested in yeah so i mean roughly speaking again there's a big variety in you know if you're looking at central asia the stands it does there is a big um variety of landscapes altitudes etc so you're typically looking at kind of mid mid april to early june or on the other side sort of late september to maybe early november it, it does depend exactly where you want to go um to to sort of determine that but it, it'll generally be that sort of spring and uh, autumn window will be the best time um, to, to travel in those okay areas. thank you very much thank you yeah. there are Brilliant dates if you, if you, Thank you very much. There, there are dates on the on the website if you go to any of the tours for the group tours, and there generally we'll always try and schedule those at the most suitable times in terms of the yeah the, the weather. Yeah, yeah. So that'll give you an idea of when it's good to go as well. Many David, hello, David. Hi. This is uh, Trevor Hill from Hi, Thornbury. Um, clearly, you're an enthusiast and a specialist for this entire route and and, uh, and area of the world. But if um, either money or time were to restrict your ambitions, knowing what you know, which single country would you recommend? Um, oh, that's a difficult one. Um, I'm a huge fan of Iran, which I didn't touch on in this presentation at all. I mean, I find it an amazing country. The people are incredible, uh, very hospitable, very safe as a country to travel in as well, despite what people may think. But I think probably the the the... For most people, I would suggest Uzbekistan. Um, I think it's got a, it's got a, it's got good infrastructure. It's got decent hotels. Not all of these places do. Some of them are a lot more rustic, um, and it's got incredible sites. And you can go for, you know, you could. I, I would say you need a minimum of sort of eight nine days. But you know, if you can spend two weeks there, you can really get a sense of the whole country, and you know, it will give you a taste for the region and, and we do have because a lot of people start with Uzbekistan we, we actually purposely devised a tour for people who wanted to go back to the region um, which is our four stands tour which takes in the other four so you can go to visit Uzbekistan and then you have a ready-made tour to if you like it and you want to come back and see more of the region there's a ready-made tour to, um, to, to, to see. That's clever. And what would be the best time to go to Uzbekistan? It's more or less the same, the same times that I mentioned. So sort of late April, well, mid-April to early June and sort of late September to, to early November. You can go a little bit later as well. You can go a bit more towards the winter. Um, it's becoming more popular. It's a little bit more off-season. Um, with Uzbekistan, I mean, obviously at the moment, they're all better off in terms of the, this kind of information. But in general, in Uzbekistan, you need to book kind of well in advance because it did get, you know, the, the, the choice accommodation was very popular and, and got got filled up quite quickly obviously in the current time i mean it's difficult to say that but um that's got sort of the general principle with uzbekistan it is somewhere that has seen more and more tourists it's definitely in, in the the central asian region it definitely sees a lot more than than any of the other countries thank you very much for all of that and thanks for the presentation no you're very welcome thank you okay um, Oh, yes. I, may I ask a question? My name's Alison. Um, yes. I was just wondering what about rail travel and things like that? 
It says you, the answer to my question is that you do mainly road with some internal flights, but what about rail and things like that? There aren't too many options other than Uzbekistan, to be honest. Um, most of the countries, the rail is not a, it's not reliable and it's, it's not a fantastic way to get around generally. There aren't that many routes. Uzbekistan is the exception. I mean, there are a few options in Iran, but they're, they're not always easy to, to mm-hmm. avail of. But Uzbekistan has good routes between Tashkent, the capital, and Samarkand, and from Samarkand to Bukhara, and they're building the route now from Bukhara to Kiva. Um, so we expect that that should come online. I mean, it was scheduled to come online this year, I believe. Um, and if, I don't know, I haven't heard an update recently, but um, but you can certainly cover a good chunk of that. And they're nice trains, they're fast, they're comfortable, um, and it's a nice way to, to see the country as well. But yeah, so Uzbekistan, definitely, we do typically include at least one train ride in, in Uzbekistan, if not more. Um, but beyond that, they're, they're, the trains are not generally a great option. China as well, actually, sorry, China has some good train options as well. Um, they vary according to which section. So some of them are the sort of the fast, comfortable trains. Some are a lot more sort of old fashioned, but still a nice experience if you're, if you're okay with that kind of thing. Thank you. Sure. Um, Christine has asked a question as well on the chat, so about um, Iran, Oman, and Uzbekistan in terms of safety as a single woman, and I would say unequivocally yes to all three. Um, it, people think Iran in particular is somewhere that they won't be safe. Iran is an extremely safe country once you're there and you're not doing anything that the authorities, you know. The people who get in trouble in Iran are, are people who have done something that they shouldn't have done generally or if you obviously, if you're somebody who has a, a dual citizen, um, in, you're an Iranian and something else, you need to be obviously a little bit more careful. The Iranians will consider you fully Iranian and treat you as such. But for for foreigners in any of these countries, Uzbekistan is is possibly the safest country in the world. Um, Oman, you can travel anywhere. It Oman can be. Um, Ironically, you might see less women um, on the street in Oman and have less chance to meet with women in Oman than the other two. Um, Iran and Uzbekistan, women are everywhere. You'll see women walking by themselves in Tehran, even late at night into the, the, the wee hours of the morning, you'll see women walking in Tehran by themselves. It's, it's safe. It's one of the things that I constantly saw with people who would arrive into groups to, to Iran is, you know, everybody's been filled with stories of, you know, Iran and negative news for so many years that everybody, you know, those who were brave enough to come and see it would sort of arrive looking over their shoulder a little bit when they arrived and, and within 24 hours you just see them completely relaxed because, you, you know, you can go to the local park and see the kids running around and the parents are only half paying attention and people are smiling and you realize this isn't a dangerous place, you know, no people are, you, you can sense a dangerous place by the way that people are react and how they look at each other and how they are and um, it isn't. Um, Is so, there yeah. sort of anywhere along the Silk Road would you say okay for single women to travel? Um, is there anywhere along the road that isn't okay for single women to travel? Um, obviously there are individual cities that are, are probably less safe and you need to be more careful. Um, I'm trying to think of anywhere that stands out. I mean Turkmenistan is somewhere you need to travel with a guide at all times. Um, mm. Iran also, if you are, are a British passport holder, you will need to have a guide everywhere you go in any case. So you wouldn't be able to, to travel you know, independently in these places anyway. But um, Lebanon is always somewhere that has some, some issues. They tend to be you know, in particular areas. And you know, obviously it's something that um, we would always be well aware of any issues that are, are going on and to steer clear of anywhere that there was there was trouble but most of the time Lebanon is very safe but you know it does obviously you know I don't know what exactly happened um, yesterday but obviously that's an that's an instance where where something has happened the Caucasus region is generally safe as long as you're staying to the sort of you know the path that you're supposed to there are areas that are obviously a little bit more wild but they're not generally the kind of places that you would go as a tourist Okay. Do you, when you do your tours, do yeah. you have a guide with you all the time? Yes. Yes. Okay. 
Yeah. So if it's a multi-country tour, typically we will switch guide at the the, band, the border. So you'll have a guide from that country. Uh, otherwise, you'll have the same guide in most cases throughout the whole tour. Um, but yeah, there will be a guide that would accompany the tours all the way through. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just had another question in from Derek and Myra asking, saying we're in our 70s. How strenuous are the sightseeing tours? We're reasonably fit, but long days even every day might be a strain. Um, the our tours are designed for people generally 50 plus and all the way up to their 70s and 80s. Again, as you said, you do need to be reasonably fit. Um, there are, we try to factor in some free time as well. So there is a little bit of downtime, though some days can be quite full. Um, there isn't anything generally um, in, on most of our cultural or sightseeing tours that in, requires any sort of long walking or any big hill climbs. There are occasional sites, so the Mount Nemros in Turkey that I showed you, the, where the statues were overlooking um, the Tigris and the Euphrates, is, is you know that requires about a half an hour up steps. Um, again, if there are any individual sites that are um, you know, going to be too difficult for anybody, you know, people can obviously sit at those individual sites, um, you know, and either, you know, usually the guy, it's best if you're not sure to speak to the guide in the beginning and sort of, you know, the guide will find a, a solution in, uh, at Nemrut, there's a nice place where you can just sit and wait, basically, um, you've got beautiful views and you can have a coffee while you're waiting for people if that's something that you're not able to do. We, ha we had a, a 65 year old American woman who came with her 90 year old mother and did that tour um, and she did sit at that place um, because it was going to be too much for her but nonetheless she managed to do the rest of the tour. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're reasonably fit, absolutely. If you've got any specific concerns, it's best to sort of speak early to the guide you know, obviously let us know it as well ahead of the tour and we can pass that on as well so that they're aware and they can just check with you when you arrive, you know, and make sure that you're, you're feeling comfortable throughout the tour. All right. Um, does anyone else have any other questions or will we leave it at that? Um, well, I've had a question before, so if nobody else has got anything, you've mentioned Oman. Yes. Um, and um, I haven't uh, seen any tours that you do to Oman. Have you time to tell us anything about that or is, would that be something different? Um, I can give you a very, very quick overview. We, we've got sort of two main tours that we do in Iran. Uh, sorry, no. uh, Oman. 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 Yeah, no, sorry. I did have Oman. It was a slip at the time. Um, so two main tours that we do. One covers the northern part of the country. Um, this is kind of the... I guess the, the more developed part of the country, but maybe a bit more historical as well. Um, there's a lot of really interesting sites. You've, you've got the desert, you've got the, 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 the wadi towns, the sort of uh, well towns, um, some very traditional villages. Um, you've got some shipbuilding, you've got some turtle beaches. Um, I guess it's more the sort of the standard area where people travel, but um, we try to make it a little bit different because we travel to the unknown, so we try to add in a little bit more off the beaten track. Um, but we also do a tour that covers both north and south, um, and south is a lot more off the beaten track, a very different feel to it, and um, it, it's a lot, in, in many ways it feels less developed and is less developed than the north, um, but it's, it's also got a, the people look different as well, they're darker, there's a, a historical connection with the, the eastern coast of Africa as well. So there's been a lot of sort of migration over the years from there. Um, and But it, again, there's some really interesting sites down there. This is where frankincense came from. In fact, you can drive all the way up to almost to the border with Yemen. Obviously, you're not going to go into Yemen because it's not a safe <laughs> country. But, but you, you can get along to, to, to that part of the country. And it's it's just, it's a it's a big contrast, actually. It's, you know, I, how, I how long are those, to, both those tours? So the first one is 10 days, I think. And the second one is 14. Okay. Um, any of those? possibly going this autumn? Um, I wouldn't be able to give you an answer to that right now. Um, I'd okay. have to check with uh, my team who would be, be more involved oh, in this. I'll, um, I'd be interested. I'm, I'm really wanting to go somewhere interesting this autumn, if possible. Yeah. Hey-ho. Thank you. Okay, well, much. yeah, if you, want, if you want to have a chat with Carolyn or, or one of the, yeah. the, the, the guys or girls that uh, see the world um, and, you know, just pass on the message and we'll, we'll have a look for something for you. would be more than happy to. Thank you.
Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm not sure I can't see it. Thank you still on here, but I hope uh, I hope it was enjoyable for you for you all. And uh, thanks very much for joining us. Um, I'm Zoe. Did you want to say anything before we we finish up? No. If there's no more questions, just thank you everyone for attending, and of course, thank you to yourself um, and Sunita for doing this for us. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.